20 years ago, His Highness the Aga Khan had the vision of creating the Aga Khan Award for Architecture to encourage ongoing dialogue about architecture, culture, and society. From the outset, his initiative reflected a humanist tradition, bringing together the world's finest minds and talents, regardless of politics, religion, geographic location, or ideology, to discuss the improvement of the built environments of Muslims. In the seven completed cycles of the award, successive independent master juries have consistently selected projects aimed at improving the physical and social circumstances of the most underprivileged societies. At the same time, they have signaled accomplished expressions of contemporary design and the successful protection and revitalization of historic buildings and cities. Each jury meets three times to consider projects that have been nominated by a network of professionals. From a first group of several hundred nominations prepared and organized at the award archives, they identify projects for further detailed study. From these, they choose a smaller number of projects for review by a group of architectural experts who spend three to five days visiting each project on site. The technical review experts present their findings personally to the master jury. At this third meeting of the master jury, after more than two weeks' time invested in the selection process, the winning projects are determined. The award's concern for social responsibility became apparent during the very first cycle in 1980, when an improvement program for the infrastructure and living conditions of the most impoverished areas of Jakarta was acclaimed. This recognition continued during each successive cycle, expanding to include programs for urban upgrading, land tenure, temporary and refugee settlements, and social and community initiatives. Such projects, too, constituted an incentive for those architects, engineers, designers, and planners who give priority to the needs of society. The 1998 award cycle includes an entirely new type of project, the slum networking of Indore City, India. This initiative successfully achieves basic improvements to the infrastructure of underprivileged communities and does so while enhancing the natural environment within a major urban centre. Another concern of the award in urban areas is the protection and revitalization of historic districts. The successive juries have given awards to two types of approaches to these conservation efforts. In the first, individual buildings have been restored architecturally to accommodate new programs, usually as cultural or social centers. They also have served as demonstration projects, providing restoration, renovation, and rehabilitation techniques to the old city residents. The second approach to historic environments has been a more integrated one that addresses the built fabric of entire districts, one that brings architectural restoration together with programs for social development and economic sustainability. This is particularly evident in another winning project this cycle, the rehabilitation of Hebron Old Town, the heroic undertaking of dedicated residents to revitalize the abandoned, dilapidated, almost dead Old Town of Hebron. Social needs have also been met by giving awards to rural health facilities. Two hospitals in Mali and Mauritania have been characterized by architectural innovation that creatively employs local technology and materials while responding to specific needs. Likewise, in this cycle, the Lepers Hospital in India was built using local skills to create a setting of peace and comfort for patients ostracized by society. 
the building symbolizes the hope of architecture to serve all people. Throughout the history of architecture, private houses have provided fertile ground for the expression and development of innovation and design excellence. They have often been featured in previous cycles of the award. Here too, social consciousness has played an important role in the private houses selected by the award. This cycle, the jury selected the Salinger residence in Malaysia as an important expression of the reinterpretation of traditional Malay architecture and craftsmanship in a contemporary fashion which is respectful of the environment. Landmark achievements in contemporary architecture have also had a prominent place in each cycle of award recipients, though again, always with specific symbolic, historic and climatic relevance to local context. Architectural excellence that embodies innovation and new solutions has been demonstrated in a wide range of building types that include, among others, mosques, government facilities and infrastructure. Three contemporary architecture projects are represented this cycle. They demonstrate the vibrancy and high caliber of contemporary architecture in Muslim societies. The Alhamra Arts Council is a fortress-like compound that opens itself to the public of Lahore via art, theater and performance. Vidan Bhavan houses the regional parliament of Madhya Pradesh state and is a complex which symbolizes government as the voice, expression and plurality of society. Tuwake Palace is a recreational facility which draws inspiration from the natural environment and arid desert climate in Saudi Arabia. Examples of living vernacular have been seen as important commitments to the continuation of architectural heritage, both from the point of view of conservation and as an attitude towards new buildings. Likewise, voices of popular expression are evidence of yet another aspect of the pluralism of the award. In a similar vein, a classicist approach, which gives importance to authenticity and the indigenous technologies and building practices of the historical past has come forth. The development and use of appropriate technologies have been important in achievements that have had wider impact as prototypes. A commitment to appropriate technology has been clearly voiced. The growing urbanization of nearly all parts of the Muslim world has resulted in achievements that have been important contributions to the award. Architect designed complexes and cooperative projects are perhaps the most important areas of housing supply and several examples have received attention in the award. Although only one example of rural housing has been awarded, its proven role as a prototype and the number of similar examples it has inspired make it an important one indeed. Semi-urban settlements and the continuing phenomenon of rural urban migration is yet another concern of the award, particularly given the number of people who seek shelter in new situations. Prior cycles of the award have given attention to the fine restoration of important historical landmarks. In particular, they have given impetus to encouraging traditional crafts and technologies. The adaptive reuse of historical buildings has also been singled out for attention, especially when the new programs have aimed at wider social, community or educational initiatives. This cycle, landscaping efforts are important components of several winning projects. 
the award has given particular attention to seeking out and encouraging solutions for urban green spaces for the social, cultural and environmental enhancement of cities. Like this year, there have also been important initiatives which have been recognised in previous cycles. During past cycles, regionalism has been a focus which transcends building types and geography. In the Middle East, contextual architecture emerged as an alternative to the dominance of the international style. In North Africa, modern buildings have also been carefully related to their context without resorting to pastiche. And a new vernacular has been created there, based upon traditional technologies and materials. Like the geographic spread of the Islamic world from West Africa to the Indian subcontinent to Southeast Asia, regionalism is evidenced by a diversity of architectural forms. The creative potential of materials on hand and their appropriateness to the local environment has resulted in many exemplary buildings for both rural and urban populations. These reflect the diversity of Muslim societies. Today, over 20 million Muslims live in the West, creating new demands for buildings that symbolize their views within the various societies into which they have become integrated. The projects awarded this cycle, like the previous ones, indicate the enormous breadth of the award and its uncompromising objectives. They give an idea, too, of the wide variety of people eager and able to contribute to our work as they come from all lands and represent all views. Through the language of architecture, the award seeks to encourage and enhance communications and real dialogue that will have a positive impact on the built environment of Muslims today and in the future. Your Majesties, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it is my distinct pleasure to open the 1998 award presentation ceremony of the Arkan Award for Architecture. It is an honor to do so in the presence of their majesties, the King and Queen of Spain, and a privilege to welcome them and all of you here this evening. I would like to take special note of the largest contingent of ministers of governments from the Islamic world ever to attend this event. I interpret their presence as an expression of interest and commitment to the thoughtful process of physical change in their societies. The triennial presentation ceremony of the Award for Architecture is the culmination of a careful, comprehensive, and intense effort to identify building projects worthy of worldwide attention in Islamic societies. Tonight, we will celebrate the achievements represented by the seven projects selected this year. This evening's occasion has special significance in that it marks the completion of the award's first 20 years. We are therefore especially grateful for your majesty's presence and for your support, that of the royal household, the Spanish government, and the government of Andalusia in making it possible to celebrate this occasion in this remarkable setting. Each award presentation ceremony has been held in a setting of special significance in the history of Islamic architecture. The Alhambra Palace is in the very best of this tradition. And I would like to thank the administration and the municipality of Granada for their assistance in the arrangements for all of the activities here today. This exceptional expression of the genius of Islamic buildings and gardens is beautifully presented and maintained, a credit to all those responsible for its management and indicative of the respect for culture and architecture in its richness and diversity that is so enthusiastically embraced here in Spain. For the first time, the award presentation ceremony is being held in Western Europe. 
Spain's example of successful cultural pluralism, reaching back into all chapters of its history and out to the diverse array of countries in the region, including an important part of the Islamic world, makes this a particularly appropriate and inspiring setting. Under His Majesty King Juan Carlos's wise and foresighted leadership, Spain's bridging role between Europe and the Ummah is being enhanced to the benefit of both. Having completed 20 years, a generation in human terms, it is appropriate to offer some observations on the awards record. The decision to create the award stemmed from a sense that Islamic societies had lost some of their extraordinary inheritance in a domain of human creativity in which they once set standards for the rest of the world. Skill, knowledge, and vision in the realm of architecture were once a hallmark of Islamic civilizations and central to the identity of its peoples. The overarching goal of the award is to stimulate the reawakening of that inheritance and nurture its continuing evolution in contemporary terms by seeking examples of creative solutions to the wide range of needs for buildings and public spaces. The master juries appointed anew for each cycle and completely independent in their work have brought many remarkable projects to the attention of the wider public and have created what is now a continuing discourse about architecture appropriate for Muslim communities as they confront the modern world. This year's jury, whom I would like to take this opportunity to commend and thank for their work, has made its own distinctive contribution to this process. The results of its decision to search for projects with a wide global context and meaning, as well as those with regional significance, has yielded a rich and interesting mixture of award-winning projects. Collectively, the 76 projects selected for premiation over the last 20 years share a celebration of the humanity of inspired architecture and confirm the potential of its social purposes. They are also distinguished by the pluralism of the cultures of the Islamic world in which they are rooted, a pluralism that all master juries have both honored and trusted. This richness of cultural expression is even more fully documented in the materials collected on the hundreds of projects considered but not selected in each cycle of the award. But what are the prospects for the pluralism of cultures in the Islamic world, their richness of expression, and their contributions to world culture as one looks ahead over the next 20 to 40 years? On the basis of my extensive travels as Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims, or in connection with the activities of the Arkan Development Network, I feel there are grounds for serious concern. Rapidly expanding populations, increasing environmental degradation, and the unevenness of development and resources all contribute to the growth of an underclass that has never had sufficient opportunity or support for participation in cultural activities. More recently, the seemingly universal increase of migration to the cities and the tragedy of dislocated populations seeking refuge from civil strife in many parts of the world have brought further pressure. Both of these processes remove people from familiar surroundings and thrust them into the unknown in terms of culture. Finally, there is the avalanche of new images whether projected by the modern global electronic media or by more traditional orthodoxies that make hegemonic claims with new vigor in response to it. Both are very powerful forces. Both are monopolistic in intent and neither nurtures or even respects pluralism. In conclusion, 
I would offer several propositions based on lessons drawn from the experience of the Arcturn Award for Architecture. They are relevant to its future work, and perhaps more globally, to the process of cultural development and change. The loss of our inheritance of cultural pluralism, the identity it conveys to members of diverse societies, and the originality it represents and stimulates in all of them, will impoverish our societies now and into the future. Sustaining this inheritance will require conscious and concerted effort involving the best minds and most creative institutions around the world. This effort must be grounded in an informed understanding of history and cultural context, and yet be forward-looking and imaginative as it addresses the needs of contemporary societies. It will require an enabling environment characterized by open and unfettered debate of ideas, a trust in cultural diversity, the celebration and reward of innovation, and a commitment to civil society and pluralistic government. It will also necessitate that the cultures of the developing world establish a presence on the rapidly growing information superhighway to balance those that currently dominate the new electronic media. This will require an investment of time and resources and a mastery of regional and international languages. Unless these cultures develop creditable and creative ways to present themselves effectively in this new and powerful medium of communication, cultural pluralism will suffer a massive setback. Your Majesties, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, the search started by the Arkan Award for Architecture 20 years ago will continue. It will remain committed to learning and sharing what it has learned. Although its focus is Islamic societies, its quest to develop knowledge and understanding that is outward looking and universal in nature. And it is in that very spirit that I am grateful for your presence here tonight. Thank you. Hebron is an important religious center for Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Located along the pilgrimage route to Mecca, Hebron has a long and turbulent history. Today, it's a city of 126,000 that has grown far beyond its ancient boundaries. Prior to 1967, Hebron Old Town had a population of 10,000 inhabitants. Ensuing conflicts led to evacuation of the old city and 85% of the historic stone houses were abandoned. Left empty and unattended, the buildings fell into disrepair. The Hebron Rehabilitation Committee, HRC, a group which includes officials, concerned local residents and NGOs, assumed responsibility for restoring and upgrading the historic houses and urban fabric. Work began in 1995 and is ongoing. To date, 127 dwellings and 25 shops have been restored and work is progressing on 95 other buildings. Primary interventions include the provision of stairs where needed, the introduction of running water, sewage systems and new electrical wiring. Alterations are limited to the interior spaces in order to preserve the unified urban fabric. Many sensitive issues had to be faced, among them such technical complications as land and property ownership, or such complex questions as cultural identity and historical consciousness. These were handled in an effective manner without disturbing the social structure of the city or shifting the ownership of buildings from the original inhabitants. The revitalization of Hebron Old Town has also had a positive economic effect on the city. The shops located underneath the restored and reoccupied houses are once again active commercial centers like the souks. 
Because of the pride and concern of the local community, the once abandoned and dilapidated old town is now healthy and vibrant. The remarkable architecture of Hebron Old Town has been saved. The growth of Indore as a commercial centre resulted in an influx of migrants, most of whom settled into slums along the banks of the Khan and Sarawati rivers located in the heart of the city. The urban sewerage system served only 5% of the city's population. Untreated sewage and solid waste were discharged directly into the rivers, creating unhygienic conditions. The slum networking of Indoor City is a community-based sanitation and environmental improvement program that regards urban slums not as resource-draining liabilities, but as opportunities to make sustainable changes and improvements to the city as a whole. Devised and pioneered by the engineer Himanshu Parikh, the success and sustainability of the networking concept was made possible by bringing together communities, governments, NGOs and industry for its implementation. Parikh took advantage of the location of 183 of Indoor's slums to introduce an efficient infrastructure path for sewerage, storm drainage and freshwater services that followed the natural river courses. These improvements were realized through innovative and low-cost engineering solutions and implemented at two levels. At the city level, a main sewerage artery was constructed along the riverbank. At the slum level, dwellers paid for and built their own private toilets with connections to water and sewerage lines. As an incentive, a state government ordinance gave the slum dwellers long-term land leases, improved roads, water services, sewage treatment, the cleaning of the rivers, the installation of street lights, and the building of community halls led to dramatic improvement of the quality of life in the slums. Earlier projects had provided community toilets and washrooms, but sharing such facilities gave rise to communal riots. By upgrading the houses and equipping them with individual toilets and washrooms, the slums are now virtually crime-free. The slum networking of Indoor City has transformed the environment and improved the quality of life by providing a clean and livable habitat for its citizens. Leprosy affects about 3% of the population in South Asia. The afflicted are often expelled from their families or even killed. Begging is the only way for thousands of these outcasts to survive. The Lepers Hospital, a refuge on the border of the remote and forested Satpura Preserve in Maharashtra, is the first treatment centre for leprosy in the region. The project was initiated by Clara Lehrberg, who wanted to provide care for indigent lepers. To support the project, local authorities donated a site outside La Sua village. In 1983, Jan Olaf Jensen and Per Christian Brynildsen, two young Norwegian architecture students, were asked by the Lehrbergs to draw a site plan for a leper's hospital. The aim was to provide a safe haven, a treatment centre, and a village-to-village -village nursing program. The architects developed a rectangular plan in which a series of linear buildings, four metres wide, enclose a courtyard conceived as a paradise garden. Construction began in June 1983. The Lepers Hospital is built of slate and steel from Rajasthan, sandstone quarried from the adjacent hills, bricks purchased in nearby villages, teak cut in the jungle, and lime ground and mixed on site. The shallow brick vaults are clad with broken glazed tiles that were recovered from a local factory. White tiles that reflect the sun's heat cover the enclosed spaces, while colored tiles top the verandas. Jensen and Brynaldsen stayed 13 months in Chopta, 
overseeing as many as 70 workers whose only machine tools were a truck used to transport materials and a concrete vibrator. Today, the lepers' hospital serves hundreds of outpatients. Resident patients work the fields around the enclave and tend buffaloes whose milk sustains them. In the courtyard, trees and flowers provide shade and beauty and the calm of a garden. For the patients, the hospital is the door of hope in a society that had made no provision for them. Built on a former rubber plantation located south of Kuala Lumpur, the Salinger residence is a contemporary interpretation of traditional Malay wooden houses. The first thing in the design of the Salinger's house was the environment. Architect the Jimmy C.S. Lim incorporates environmentally sensitive methods for building in tropical climates. Traditional Malay houses are post and beam hardwood structures raised on stilts with infill panels of timber and side verandas. In developing their architectural brief, the Salingers wanted a modern house that also reflected their Islamic faith and keen interest in Malay culture. The architect organized their requirements in an open plan of two equilateral triangles placed one against the other. The larger triangle accommodates indoor living and the second, smaller triangle, is for outdoor living. The interior spaces flow naturally to the outdoors and the open plan ensures cross-ventilation. Lim's work is concerned with sustainable ecological principles that have minimal environmental impact. Therefore, he placed the Salinger's house at a high point on the three-acre wooded lot in order to reduce water runoff during the monsoon rains and oriented it to capture the prevailing breezes. He reduced the impact of the building on the land by lifting the house on stilts, thus eliminating the need for major excavation work and retaining the natural sloping contours of the site. Indigenous elements were incorporated in the design, including the use of local hardwood, and elaborate roof forms with large overhangs. The Salingers hired a team of traditional Malay carpenters from Kalantan to build the house, and Lim designed the joinery details with them. While traditional in its materials and method of construction, the house is a modern building that interprets rather than imitates Malay culture. Tuwake Palace is the recreation centre for the diplomatic quarter in Riyadh. The building stands on a high limestone plateau that juts towards Wadi Hanifa and the desert. In 1980, the Ariad Development Authority, ADA, organised a limited design competition for Tuwake Palace. The solutions of Fry Otto of Germany and Omrania of Riyadh attracted attention. Otto's for the use of tents, and Omrania's for a terraced building that engaged the landscape. The ADA asked the two firms to work together, and their collaboration resulted in a snaking 800 meter long wall that wraps around and protects a green garden or oasis. Restaurants and a swimming pool are accommodated in three tent structures fanning out from the wall. Thus, the design makes reference to two local archetypes, the fortress and the tent, and incorporates the natural phenomenon of oases. The winding plan of Tuwake Palace contains a variety of programs, including sport facilities and lodging for visiting guests. The exterior stone-clad walls wrap around the courtyard oasis that is deliberately concealed from the outside, and the fan shapes of the white Teflon tents reflect the natural curves and slopes of the site. In the courtyard, blue tents shade the building entrances. A unified whole is achieved by the consistent use of materials and by subtle control of the large building mass. 
From a distance, Tuwek Palace appears to be a fort surrounded by an encampment, enriched by tents, walls, oases and walkways with ever-changing vistas. This reinterpretation is a daring confrontation between tradition, landscape and high technology. The Alhambra Arts Council was a non-governmental group interested in the visual and performing arts. Prior to the 1970s, most of their productions were held in the open air. A new architectural program began when Naya Ali Dada was retained to design an initial 1,000-seat theatre, which was completed in 1979. The council was later placed under the auspices of a government agency, the Lahore Arts Council, which oversaw the subsequent phases of the project. During the second phase, completed in 1984, four octagonal structures were added to house administrative offices and exhibition galleries. Third and fourth phase auditoriums and offices were completed by 1992. Throughout this 15-year process, Dada retained a basic design concept based on polygonal shapes that enhance acoustics. Another design premise was the use of solid red brick walls, recalling the red sandstone architecture of Mughal Lahore. In the final complex, geometric forms, built volumes and materials are handled skillfully and come together to create a unified ensemble. Equally important are the courtyard and green spaces between the various buildings, which are used by the public as meeting places, thus creating a bustling atmosphere. The Alhambra Arts Council is now used by more than 3,000 people a day, and the theatres accommodate two sold-out performances each night. Auditoriums, galleries and practice rooms provide local artists, music students and the public with spaces to perform, to view and to appreciate a wide variety of the arts. In his innovative use of indigenous materials and traditional forms, Dada recalls the images of the Mughal forts without reverting to cliches or symbols. The Alhambra Arts Council, with its rich and varied programme of theatre, music and art, has restored Lahore's role as the cultural capital of Pakistan. Vidhan Bhavan, the new state assembly for the government of Madhya Pradesh, sits on top of a rara hill overlooking the capital city of Bhopal. Charles Correa organized the large government facility in a series of courtyards and pathways that break down the volume into spaces that welcome public participation. This is a reflection of his long-time concern for humanist values. The plan of the building was developed as a circle and provides cohesive unity. Three different entrances punctuate the circle at 90 degree intervals. The program for the State Assembly specified four main functions. A lower house, an upper house, the combined hall and the library with administrative and service areas. Circulation is labyrinthine and follows the edges of the open air courtyards that Korea created as gardens within gardens and around which the administrative offices are organized. Though its commanding hilltop site and unusual form attract the eye, Vidan Bhavan is conceived not as a monument, but instead as a city within a city. The use of local red stone, handmade ceramic tiles and painted surfaces help to humanize the public complex. Throughout the building, there are references to Madhya Pradesh, gateways, enclosures, courts, small domes and other architectural details 
develop a new imagery based on traditional forms. Large contemporary murals, sculpture and paintings by local artists decorate the building. Vidan Bhavan is a successful integration of local art and architectural traditions in a modern building.